Friends, welcome. My name is Stephen Fetter, and I manage the United Learning Program for the General Counsel Office. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to our Thursday afternoon program. It's, it's a, a thrill to be able to connect with you from all across the country and to, to see all the different places that you're coming from. I'm just having a private conversation with somebody who remembers my dad in ministry from DC. So that's, that's really cool. And, and thanks for letting me know about that. The church is small. There are no secrets. So, so be warned. Just as we begin, wanted to invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the territory where you're sitting today. We are sitting on land that has been inhabited and uh, nurtured by people for 10,000 or more years. And it's appropriate as we begin these sessions to acknowledge that and all of the different nations that have been taking care of this land and been taken care of by it. So let's just take a moment to acknowledge that. We'll type the names in the chat. I'm not going to try to read them aloud. I did that a few weeks ago and I totally got myself embarrassed because I couldn't pronounce all the names. I'm acknowledging the, the land of the, the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the, of the uh, Credit River. Thank you. I'm going to allow you to continue typing, and I'm going to invite our, uh, our leaders to introduce themselves today. We've got Tricia Elliott with us and Dave Jagger, and maybe I'll turn to Tricia first because you're right there on, on the left on my screen. So Tricia, who are you and what brings you into this call today? And, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a minister, first off, and uh, I work in the philanthropy unit, and I am responsible for the creative communications around mission and service. So that's my role within the unit. Dave? I am Dave Jagger. I am a stewardship and gifts officer. So I look after most of South, Southwestern Ontario. Um, and I also work as part of the unit with congregational generosity and giving. And that's what brings me here today. Great. Well, uh, thank you to the two of you. I know it's, it's uh, um, not our normal practice to pull a webinar together in about three days. Uh, but it's it's become our practice in, in this pandemic, and I want to thank you for all of the, the the work and time you've put into this pulling things together so quickly. Friends, when when we started thinking about all of the different topics that we ministers need as we we work our way into the pandemic, we knew that way back in March when we first did one of these Thursday programs, uh, we talked about finances. And we invited Dave and Trish to come and talk about stewardship. And that was a portion of the financial webinar that we did. And there's a lot of water under the bridge since then. hundred years um, ago. <laughs> I think w when we were doing this in the middle of March, none of us really knew what was going to happen and how things were going to unroll. And in many ways, we were flying blind and, and creating by the seat of our pants and and it's been eight weeks since now. Can you believe it? Uh, eight weeks of experimenting with different things. And eight weeks of trying to, to find new ways of being church together when we can't be in our building. And new ways of trying to connect with the congregations that we lead when we can't see them and shake hands with them on Sunday mornings. And so we thought after eight weeks of all of that experimenting, it's probably good to step back and take stock and say, what have we learned? in these eight weeks and where are we at now and what's changed since since the last time uh, we did some intentional thinking together about stewardship and generosity and church finances and and our role as as uh, ministers and clergy and, and lay leaders in in the middle of all that so thrilled and delighted to bring dave and trisha back in again and uh, dave i think you're first on the agenda so let me turn things over to you and uh um Lead us through it. Perfect. Thank you. It's great to be here. I recognize lots of names in the windows. As you said, we are a small, a small community, although we feel very large at times. Um, I'm going to steal a little bit from the Wednesday night treasurer sessions that Eric Matheson has been doing, and I'm going to start us off with the new creed. Um, I'm just going to read it. Uh, your job is just to sit and to listen, to listen to the phrases that bring you comfort to listen for the ideas that feed your mind and to feel the passion and the peace that 
enriches your soul and your spirit. So we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, and in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. I would invite you to uh, follow on the screen and uh, we will pray together. Holy God, Gathering as your people, we ask that you make us attentive to your call in our lives. Help us to notice the things you do among us, the things you stir in our hearts, the opportunities that surround us to share your love with others. We hold each other in prayer, asking your blessing, your peace, and your strength. This we do in Jesus' name. Amen. We are called to be the church. The church is the community of Jesus. For years, but especially over the last few, I have been constantly being called and drawn back to the beginnings of the church. And the piece at the beginning that has struck me the most in these days, and, and again, for some time, is the first time in Scripture that we get a sense of what is at the heart of the community of Jesus at the end of the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Just going to read it for you. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I read that and I hear that with different ears in the time of COVID-19. They broke bread at home. Many of us now have that experience. But at its heart, one of the key requirements of being the community of Jesus is sharing what we have been given for the good of the community and of the wider world. It's all about the mission. Now, I came across this. Uh, you've probably seen it on Facebook and other places. Um, it's a cute little quote. It's pithy. It makes a point. It's been attributed to Churchill, although there's no proof that he actually created it. It goes something like this. Never let a good crisis go to waste. 
we're in a crisis, whether you want to call it good or not, right now. It has affected every part of the church and its ministry and every part of the community and the world other than New Zealand. And even them, it's affected. I want to propose to you today as we begin this that your role as ministers, as leaders, is critical in supporting the stewardship of your congregation and of the people that are participating in it, especially in these challenging times. It's about us, but it's also about all of us. How do we do this work of stewardship in these times? And so much of, so much of the answer to that, I, I hope we'll get into, but, but it actually is the same as what we could and should and hopefully have been doing for a long, long time. Research proves it, experience proves it. The role of the minister is critical. Yes, the lay leaders are also important, but never underestimate your power, both formal and informal, to bring about change. Depending on what the change is, it may be difficult with you, but it will be impossible without you. You are critical to the work of stewardship and to the leading of the church. That is both terrifying, I hope, but also honoring and, and just quite wonderful to consider. You have been given this privilege and this opportunity. It's not just okay to invite generosity. It's required. It's part of the job description. So on the next slide, I have a picture here that, that we've created that's called, we call it the stewardship or the discipleship flower. Each of the petals describes a spiritual practice through which people come to faith and through which they grow in their faith. I'll give you a moment to just look those over. And they're each equally important. Imagine doing ministry and never inviting someone to explore scripture or do Bible study. Imagine doing ministry and not inviting someone to prayer or to worship or to loving service for the people around them or to sharing their faith, just as I hope you wouldn't not do those things, not invite people to those things. So also we have to invite people to generosity and just as I know many of you, and, and, and you're really good at this, just as you would modify your invitation to those other practices, depending on whom you're speaking to and what their context and their situation is, well, of course, the same is true for generosity and maybe even more so in these days. As I listen to congregational leaders, clergy and otherwise talk, I hear a real concern about, you know, talking about money and asking people to, to be generous when we're really concerned and upset that they might not be able to because they've lost their job or their investments have tanked or, or whatever it is that's behind it. And, and we need to take those things seriously. But at the same time, you're not simply asking for money or for time, but you're inviting people into a spiritual practice of thoughtful, intentional generosity as they are able to be part of that. It's not just about the money. Yeah, let me let me just sort of connect with you on that for a minute, Dave. I think that's Perfect. really helpful. And I think part of where some of us in ministry get stuck is that we can feel like when we are asking people to be generous, it looks like we're asking people to chip into our paycheck. Yes. And, and so it feels self-serving and we're afraid it looks self-serving and good middle-class people never talk about money anyway. And so there's a, there's a real disconnect for a lot of us in ministry because the last thing we want to appear is self-serving. So to talk about generosity as a spiritual discipline rather than as a way to pay your dues at the club, 
I think is a real shift in gears. Can you just kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, Beth, Beth Johnson here is saying she's been accused of doing exactly that, of looking for her paycheck when she talks about money. So, so talk to us about generosity as a spiritual discipline and what changes when we think about it that way. When I think about generosity as a spiritual discipline, and when I, as a leader in the church, talk about it this way, I have to talk about it not from the, always from the perspective of the congregation. We're really good at talking about it from the perspective of the congregation. You know, when mm -hmm. you are generous, then we can do all these cool things. You mm -hmm. help to pay the bills. You make it possible. I think that treats people in many ways very badly and as if they were resources to be extracted. When we talk yeah. about generosity as a spiritual practice, I now need to talk about it as what's in this for you? Mm -hmm. why, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to be generous? Because it helps you to not be dependent upon your money. It, I mean, in theological terms and, and, and biblical terms, it protects you from idolatry uh, and greed. And it's countercultural to the way the world works. It's part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Um, thus the discipleship flower and that. And so when I am generous, not only does it defend me from those things, but it helps me grow into my caring for the people around me. It helps me be more loving. And, and therefore what's in it for me ultimately is it gets me closer to God and more in the pathway of Jesus. So I'd be interested to know from the folks who are online uh, and to add your notes into the chat, do you make that kind of distinction in the leadership you offer in your churches? Do you somehow distinguish between the spiritual discipline of generosity and the, the financial needs of the, the congregation you serve? And if, if you're kind of teasing those two apart, how do you do that? And how do you sort of exercise your pastoral role in encouraging discipleship? Just put some notes in the chat there, and, and I'd be fascinated to hear what you come up with. It's funny when I told my my family that I was I was going into take this job, the philanthropy unit. They were like horrified. You know, why would you ever want to do that? You have a nice church. You know, just stay there. It's lovely. You know. And then my aunt said to me, oh, "I was like, I'd hate a job where you had to ask for money. That's terrible." Well, philanthropy is about <laughs> more than money. I mean, financial generosity is part of that, but it's bigger than that. But when it comes to inviting people to be generous financially, I think about it as inviting people to, to discipleship. And we're at our best, I think, when we're generous. That's when I feel the best about myself, it's when I'm giving. And it can be giving money, it can be giving time, it can be uh, giving my energy or my ability. You know, I feel good. I feel meaningful and purposeful in that. And I think about it as offering an invitation to people to um to to step into their their deep spirit of goodness you know and generosity so i don't think about it as as asking for something that would take away from them i think it's inviting them into something and a real experience of discipleship in a deep and meaningful way so well and heidi's kind of saying that I mean, heidi's saying she does both that sometimes it really is about meeting the bills and heaven knows the lights need to be paid for, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am grateful to have a professional musician in my congregation and I'm delighted that we were willing to pay her. But sometimes it's also about the spiritual discipline. She said she did a whole sermon series on spiritual disciplines and certain generosity was one among them. So yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Chelsea saying the same thing, tries to do both. By the way, if, if you can't read the chat and listen at the same time, don't panic. That's my job. <laughs> and I'll do my best to kind of summarize what I'm seeing here. Um, mm -hmm. if, if all you can do is listen, you'll get what's most important. I, I think the other piece to all of that is it's got to link to the mission. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that a congregation chooses, and it's a choice, chooses to do and live out its mission is it brings in a paid professional to provide leadership, guidance, and support. That's usually called the minister. So, so you are the ministry of the church. Sure. And therefore, yes, they are paying for the ministry of the church. 
but it's easier then to draw those connections to, so what are the other ministries of the church? They need to be paid for. We need to pay the bills. We need to you know, cover those things because they allow the church to do ministry. And that's what we're really all about. Yeah. One of my strategies has tended to be to talk about generosity in the sermon and, and the needs of the building or the ministry in the announcements. Yes. That's, I don't know whether that's ducking the issue or not. And I know, I don't always do that. I mean, sometimes, sometimes the sermon needs to talk mm -hmm. about what we're doing as, as the ministry, but, but to keep the focus on ministry is important. What do you, what would you say to Susan here who is saying she's been told not to? Somebody on her board has said, you are not to talk about money or stewardship because your audience is already giving. So, so don't upset them. How would you mm -hmm. respond to that? That's a tough one. That is a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, I mean, maybe it sounds a bit cheeky, but I would be wondering what percent, I'd be asking for some data, you know, what percentage of, of people who come into the church are actually giving, how do we know that? So I would just question the assumption and then hope to get into a deeper conversation that way. And, and, and I think- Because I'm highly a, doubtful that 100% are giving, yeah, you know. Probably not. Uh, but but I, again, I think it's about making that link to this is a spiritual practice. I mean, I talk about the Bible. I, I lead you in prayer. Why would mm -hmm. I not also encourage you in generosity? It's yeah. equally or more so a part of what we are as, as disciples. Particularly um, if we're talking if I was feeling particularly of, sorry. with our time or yeah. with our, our money to somewhere else. Um, I mean, in my church, we, we collect food for the food bank on the second Sunday of every month. Yeah. And so there's an opportunity to talk about the spiritual discipline of generosity where it's very clear we're not paying my salary. That's right. It's not about and, money. And, and I think it peels back too to, to sharing, you know, so maybe, okay, let's go with everybody's giving. Um, maybe there are people who, who would give more um, if they were asked and would feel really good about that or were invited, you know? And would feel really good about that. And how do you how do you know that if you're not doing it? You know. Um, yeah, I mean, we have people in our congregations, and I mean, this is pre-COVID. I don't know what we're going to end mm -hmm. up like, but we had people in our congregations who were good at. Um, maintenance and repairing we asked them to do that around the church we have people mm -hmm. in our congregations who are good singers we invited them to be part of the choir mm -hmm. but when we discover people who are good givers we ignore them mm. there seems an inconsistency there why wouldn't we ask them to give so here's another question we're in the middle of this pandemic all our buildings are closed yep. we can't sing in the choir um how do you make the link to mission when so much of what we do isn't happening now? The link to mission is to look for what is happening. If the mission of the church has to do with caring for each other and caring for our communities, how is your congregation doing that now? You're probably more intentional about that maybe than you were pre-COVID. Um, I mean, I hear about all the phone calls and all the messages ministers are recording or emailing and sending to make sure that everybody is staying connected and community is being built and strengthened. Uh, that's your mission. Tell the stories. Mm -hmm. Beth says more people are talking to more people now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They sure are in my congregation. Holy cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. witnessing a deeper sense of mission, actually, a deepening into the mission. You know. mm. What about some of the rest of you? How would you respond to Diane's question? Um, what's the mission in your congregation now in the middle of the pandemic? And how are, how are you talking about that to, to your congregation? Because, yeah, that's the key, right? It's not about let's keep the lights on. It's about how are we changing lives? How are we sharing love? How are we... Uh, uh, living in the light of the gospel. Yeah. I think this, this uh, pandemic has pruned. I don't know if that's the word I want to use or not, but I think mm -hmm. it's helped us to become more focused on what really does matter. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to shed some of the stuff. Maybe it's only temporary, but I suspect it'll be longer than that, that yeah. we've discovered really doesn't matter as much as we thought it did. 
Okay. Lori says, in our stewardship letter, we're talking about all the things we're still doing. Pastoral support, phone calls, emails, worships, church school online, coffee time each week. Great. Those things don't just happen. Somebody has to organize them. Yeah. And, you know, Brad Morrison in his book, Already Missional, makes the point that we, we all have a place in that greater mission. And um, we may be um, being quite missional in our own families right now. And, and we do that in a Christian way, within a Christian context, within a Christian community. And that also builds us up as a body of Christ, right? So there are ways to make missional connection with what people are living right now in their own, um, in their own family situations that I think might be really important. I would, I would recommend reading that if you haven't gotten a copy. Yeah, the, the, the spiritual practice of writing encouraging statements in chalk at people's driveways mm -hmm. that we, we see pictures of or posting things in your window. So as people walk by, they're encouraged. That's yeah. mission. <laughs> yeah, and thanking those essential workers, you know, yep. uh, people ga gathering the garbage and all the things that maybe we would have taken for granted before that and we're now seeing as essential and lifting up. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're still doing this stuff, but a lot of our habits and the routines we're used to mm -hmm can't work the same way. Mm -hmm. Like, I've got this thing sitting beside my computer. What am I supposed to do with it, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to put something in it? <laughs> well, unless, uh, unless you've developed a transporter beam on the side and haven't told us about it, that's really tricky, isn't it? Darn right. That's how we're used to. That's, that's our main, when we think of the offering, when we think of people giving, what do we think of? We think of that plate. And, and that's just not really an option anymore uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I want to quickly recommend five different ways that you can encourage people to, uh, to give, five different methods that they can use. The first is, is PAR, uh, pre-authorized giving. I assume you're all familiar with PAR. I keep, again, hearing more and more ministers saying, oh, thank heavens for PAR. Um, it's keeping us afloat right now. It, it, that's the church's perspective again. From the person's perspective, PAR is a way to be a consistent giver. Yeah, um, I don't have to worry whether I'm there or not. It's a way that I can make a statement of faith about my faith and about my community that I care for and love. I give each month regularly through PAR. Um, there is information on the United Church website about how you can set that up, and we've been able to arrange that PAR forms um, can still be processed, even though the staff are not in the general council office at this point. So um, PAR is a great way to encourage people into a consistent giving pattern, uh, which is good for their faith as well as good for your uh, budget. Um, <clears throat> the next would be Canada Helps. Um, Canada Helps is a Canadian charity whose purpose is to help foster and increase charitable giving to other Canadian charities. Um, they are focusing on online giving, so credit card, um, PayPal. Don't think you can use debit with them. I think it's just credit card. Um, but your congregation is already listed with Canada Helps because they've listed every registered charity in the country. Um, what we encourage you to do is to go and claim your page, register yourself for the full fundraising account. There's no cost to do that. Um, there is a fee that is paid when a person makes a gift to your congregation, um, but to register to have your place on there costs you nothing. Um, when you have got that set up and it's fairly straightforward and easy to do that, um, then people, when they make their gifts, those are electronically transferred straight into your church's bank account pretty much weekly. Um, plus there's other benefits to that as well. And we've got an information sheet all about Canada Helps. More congregations are starting to explore the possibility of e-transfers. <clears throat> um, this is the same way that people transfer money to each other. Um, the trick is that some congregations we're finding are having a hard time with this depending on their bank. Um, so you're going to need to go and talk to your bank and see what is possible, depending on what the bank does, the kind of account you've got, um, and, and those kind of details. Um, but there are ways that you can set that up and make that happen. Um, hey, good old post-dated checks. Um, if you're dealing with congregational members who are not into all of the online stuff, um, then encourage the use of a post of post-dated checks. They can write checks 
they have only have to they can mail them to you then there's no contact um, or if they're dropping them off at your church building um, they have to make one trip and they're good for the next six months um, I like to think of post-dated checks as kind of old school par um, it's intentional which is good for me as a giver and it's regular which is good for me and for the congregation and it's technology that most people are comfortable and familiar with um, the final option would be the offering envelope um, by which means we're also talking about cash. Now, cash is a good topic to think about. Um, there are issues around accepting cash, both the transfer of germs and, and contact. Also, if you have people who are bringing cash to your church, how secure is your church? Um, Stephen, you were talking about this earlier when we were planning. Yeah, so... My, my congregation has said we don't want to accept cash during the pandemic. And that's largely because anybody who's sending us offering envelopes is putting them through the mail slot of the church. And we don't want to encourage vandals. It's not secure. So we've, we've asked people, if you're going to give us uh, an offering envelope and you want to put it through the mail slot of the church, it'll be picked up once a week. But please don't put it in cash because it's not safe. Um, yep. It's also... It's also not safe for our staff because normally offerings are counted by two people in person at the same time. So there's a double check. Nobody's reputation is damaged if there's a mistake. And, you know, there's always witnesses. These days, that's not true. So we've been really cautious around cash in my church, but we've done all the others. And I'm wondering about folks on, on the chat, which are the popular ones in your church? What to... Uh, what are the things that people are using? Beth says her congregation does the e-transfer. They don't want to deal with Canada Helps. Go figure. Par and e-transfer, says Brenda. Those are the biggies in my church, too. Susan's yeah. asking and saying that her congregations aren't listed on Canada Helps. Um, the congregations would be listed by whatever their official name is with the CRA. Um, I had a congregation calling me a few weeks ago asking the same kind of question. They were St. Andrew's such and such and they couldn't find themselves well it turns out they were not listed under that their, their actual cra name was such and such pastoral charge named after their their location um mm -hmm. and so when we looked under the location sure enough there they were um so make yeah. sure you're looking under the official cra title because that's what canada helps will have put up there once you've registered they, they just lift yeah they just lift yeah. the names right straight out of the cra website so whatever oh. your official and they list your your number too your that's your charitable number so because those are public information but once you have registered and claimed your place <clears throat> you can then change your name um or, or at least change have a list of names that people could find you under if you're known by different things so that's another reason that's worthwhile doing the registration even if you don't get very much through one of these agencies it's good to have all of your information registered with them so that when they get something or when somebody goes looking for something, it comes to you and it doesn't just sit there and, and turn to dust because um, uh, you didn't know it was there. And some of these agencies charge you a little less if, if you're on file, if you've actually set up contact information and link your bank account and that kind of stuff. We're getting some workplace donations through an agency called Benevity. Benevity. There's, I think, two people in our congregation who have workplace withholdings with this agency, and they charge us a slightly lower fee if they can transfer the money electronically into our bank account rather than send us a check every month. So it was worth registering with them just to, to pick up that. The other thing that the registration uh, and the full fundraising account with Canada Helps gets you is the donate button on your website. Mm -hmm. um, which means not only, but well, just makes it easier for people to give who, who are using that kind of giving. That's all. Um, they can actually do it during your worship time. They can do it anytime. It's mm -hmm. easy to send people to your website and say, click the donut button, the donut, the donate button, and you'll be all set. The donut button's holier. Um, right. And then you'll be all set and uh, can make a gift simply because the easier you make it for people, the more likely they are to make a gift. So let me ask you if, if you know, friends, how how is stewardship going in your congregation we've been into the pandemic now for eight weeks are givings dropping are they staying the same are they going up how's it how how are things working out you probably have end of april numbers now i'm, I'm getting ready for a board meeting tonight maybe you are too 
<laughs> Pat says she's not poor enough for government subsidies. Oh, darn. <laughs> That's a Congratulations. good Congratulations. <laughs> Interesting. Brenda says one of the things they've noticed is the loss of any fundraising. So I yes. guess dinners and rummage sales and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So she has continued to say congregation shouldn't be dependent on fundraising to support the mission and ministry of the congregation. And now we're seeing why, because it's coming back to bite you, I guess. Eh? Don't sense. let a good crisis go to waste. Exactly. It's a great mm -hmm. teaching moment, a great opportunity to say, hey, who are we and what are we about? Interesting. Susan says March was down 60%, but April only down 15%. So people kind of picked up. That's encouraging. Yep. Mm -hmm. Doll, Doll says it's the same as previous, that it hasn't changed, which is cool. Par has gone up. Yeah, rental income is gone for us. That's our yes. financial crisis. Mm -hmm. None. But, uh, but the givings are actually up in my church. It's interesting. Somebody says, I think Warner says that there's a uh, April was solid, better than usual, but it included a very generous individual. And I think that too, we might be finding those people who have more to share, if invited to share, will share or may just spontaneously share, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. okay, you know, to say, I'm not spending as much money as I was before. Mm -hmm. like, I am not commuting into Toronto. I am not going out to restaurants. I am not buying clothes. I've got oodles of money that I wasn't expecting. And I've got people in my congregation who've lost their jobs. And so there are other people in my congregation in the same boat. And some people have mm -hmm. given more and some people have had to stop. And on balance, we're up, which is really cool. The church is a community. We take care of each other, right? And those who have it more share more. Like Acts two. I don't know. It does. We, we heard Acts two earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's important when we're talking about giving and generosity then to not to give the impression that those who are able to give more have to do so because those mm -hmm. other people over there can't give as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should be giving generously and cheerfully as we're able because mm -hmm. we're disciples of Jesus and that's what we're mm -hmm. called to do. And because mm -hmm. isn't that great that we have been like, I've been blessed and can do that. Mm -hmm. And that blessing may be because I'm not driving to Toronto all the time or because I didn't get to take my trip at March break and that money's now in mm -hmm. my bank account or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it, it, it's that question that we each ask, how can we share what we have? Yeah. <clears throat> I was supposed to be on a plane to Scotland tonight. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> okay, so friends, uh, we can't in this webinar deal with the rental side of the income stuff. And that's causing a lot of heartbreak for my board too. But what makes for a, a, a inspiring way to invent generosity? How do we talk about the pandemic that we're in and the mission of the church in a way that will inspire people to be generous uh, i know dave has got a list of tips up his back uh, in his back okay. pocket that he's going to share with us in a few minutes but before he gets there let's see how many of them we're already using maybe we'll skunk him and we'll get them all that'd be great <laughs> <laughs> i would be so happy to be skunked <laughs> then we can all go home early right <laughs> Then I'll, then I'll call for my beverage. There we go. Tell <laughs> stories. Heidi, what stories are you telling? What kind of stories? Dave, you're not entitled to a beverage unless you're wearing a, a, a very flamboyant shirt. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> Only I'd know and I have some. <laughs> there you go. I don't want to be too confused for So Eric. what makes for an inspiring invitation, friends? Yeah. Let's see what we can can kind of assemble a bunch of tips here that, that and, and maybe using. and maybe this is what do you what are you doing but maybe it's also what do you wish you could do mm. yeah if you had permission to talk about money yeah sorry susan yeah mm. wow that's awesome heidi excellent 
So, so for the recording, because they don't see. I'm sorry. Many, That's right. right. For example, a young man who's an addict and mentally ill who had accessed help from our church dropped off a generous donation as an offering to God and thanks for the church's support. Cool. Lovely. Great story to tell. And the story is about the way the church helped the young man. Yeah. The donation is a is gravy. It, it's an extra positive, but the story is we made a difference in this person's life. And he and proved Cheryl it. says her daycare rentals offered half of their rent and a promise to pay it back over the year, starting from when they return. That says we're too secret about secretive about offering. Interesting. Yeah, we can protect privacy without secrecy. Tell us what you're thinking, Beth. I'd sort of expand on that a bit. That's interesting. I had I served one congregation uh, once where the they asked me what day I was taking off, and I said, "Well, Mondays for sure, and hopefully I'll find another day in the week." But Mondays for sure, and that's when they decided to schedule all the property and finance meetings. Oh no, on your day off. <laughs> on, on purpose, so that the minister would not be involved. <laughs> so I get the pain of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is, when I was reading Beth's comment, that is what I was reminded of, the privacy. And I was told I wasn't to be there because of the privacy, you know? Yeah. And, and depending on how long I've been a part of a congregation and how snarly I was feeling, I might be inclined in my less charitable moments to respond. So I guess I don't need to worry about who's in the hospital then either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, since, I just changed since, my day since off. <laughs> I, since, I mean, well, but, but we have, there's this thing about, it's okay for us as ministers to hold highly personal health information about people yeah. and family information about people, mm -hmm. but financial information is somehow different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what Beth says. It's supposed to be none of my business. That doesn't make sense. Nope. Yeah. I'm astounded at the stories people will tell me about their health that they don't want anybody else to know. And they trust me with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think the amounts are not my business, but I, but I do think the trends are, you know, when somebody stops giving, often there's a pastoral reason for that, right? And that they, there, there needs to be a, a, a phone call for pastoral reasons, you know? Um, so there's connection there between um, how, how people are feeling a part of the community and they're giving, right? And so if something drops off or if they give dramatically, also that's good information to have because we know then that we as a church have had an impact and there may be a story that they're comfortable with us sharing around that that will uplift everyone, you know? So I wonder if we're dealing with the legacy of some bad stewardship practice mm -hmm. in previous generations mm -hmm. where people were encouraged to feel guilty because they weren't paying enough. And the nobody ever wants to feel guilty. So I won't tell you what I'm giving and then you can't guilt me, except I feel guilty mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Re realizing that's wandering into a, a different webinar, but yes. um, Not My Parents Offering Plate by Cliff Christopher mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. this, is the, the book, as far as I'm concerned, around that topic. The book's about other things as well, but that's the book that I read that changed my mind on whether I should know or not. It was also the book that was helpful in, in influencing the decision-making of my church board around whether what I should know or not and, mm -hmm. and when I should know or not. So I would highly recommend that uh, book as a good read uh, around this area. Um, the author of the book would say that if you don't know, that's, that's pastoral malpractice. Um, I don't know if I would go quite that far. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it's it's one of the ways. And if you people are worried about, oh, you'll treat us differently if you know how much we give. Well, I know how healthy you are, and I treat you differently, and you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, mm -hmm. I'm going to treat you differently because I always treat you differently because I love you all. But I love you all differently. So, so let me move us along because I know yep. you did put, put together these tips, and well, I'm loving this conversation. But, but we've got other stuff we want to talk about too. So, <laughs> slide through these, Dave, and, and we'll see how many of these we've kind of already touched on in the chat. I think a number of them are, are, are sort of implied by some of the things we've been saying. 
Yeah. A good invitation to generosity is personal because people give to people um, in order to make a difference. If people just gave for need, they'd give all the kind of money all the time because there's lots of need. It doesn't work that way. Um, it needs to speak to them. Um, it needs to be positive. Um, none of this chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. If we don't get $20,000 by the end of the, uh, urgency is a good thing. Panic is not. Um, a good invitation to generosity starts with good news about the church and it highlights how you are still doing your mission and it gives specific examples. And we've seen a bunch of that in the chat box for sure. That's good. Um, a good invitation to generosity includes thanking, um, not just for current giving, but for expected giving. We're thankful for all you do and all you are. Um, we're thankful you're just part of us even. Um, it uses you language, not just we. Um, I kind of hinted into this a little while ago. You are doing this, not we do it because of you. People are not resources to be exploited or extracted. Um, places giving in its role as a spiritual practice of disciples. Again, this is not, this is about what's in it for you, not just what's in it for the church. Um, and a good invitation to generosity makes a clear invitation. Um, this is one of the areas that congregations are often hesitant and, and scared and reluctant around is to actually ask for something specific um, and then to give good instructions on how do I do it. If you ask me to join up for PAR, you better tell me how to get on the, where the form is and what do I do with it and how do I make it happen. If, ease, if giving is not easy, people will struggle to do it and they probably won't. And then a good invitation for generosity um, on the next slide, it gives us more than one way to respond without giving so many as to create mental paralysis. Um, <clears throat> that way people can find one that works for them. I mean, I just gave you five different ways and different methods that people could give. Sure, there's others out there. Those are the five that are probably the most important and the most common. You find the one that works for you. What matters is that you give. Um, and then again, it ends on a thank you and uh, back has a personal note. Um, so those are, those are the tips that we find are very helpful in creating an invitation, which is actually an invitation. Um, it's not an ask, it's not a demand, and it definitely has nothing to do with, with guilt. Um, this is why we are the church. This is what we do. This is how you are doing your ministry, and we're so thankful for you. That's, there it is in a paragraph, fast and sweet. Um, so I've got a sample. Are you ready to move on to the yeah. sample then, Steve? Oh, sure. There's a good, good idea. <clears throat> okay. So I have a sample that I found on, um, it's from the Fifth Avenue United Church in Medicine Hat, Alberta. It's on their website, um, but you could easily do this on paper or use it in email. Um, I'd ask you to just, just have a read um, and, and then respond in the chat box. What do you notice in here? And if you did something like this in your setting, what would you do? That's a very simple statement to put on your website. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. What are you noticing, friends? I could see a statement like this in a newsletter. An e-newsletter, yeah. Yeah. Or paper, because there's still lots of congregations who are working in paper. Absolutely. Anybody doing something like this already? This is a part of the webinar where we find out how long the participants take to type. <laughs> <laughs> and why I'm not typing. <laughs> Heidi says, we have something similar going up on our website this Sunday and also in our announcements. Excellent. I like the clarity of this. The, the donate page on our church website just says where the money's going. It doesn't, it's not quite as clear as this. I, I, may, I may plagiarize some of this. Mm -hmm. I like because it begins with gratitude. Mm -hmm. It states the reality, again, without panic though. Mm -hmm. um, the offering plates are no longer being passed this, but we may be stretched too far. We have capacity though. Um, and so we, we think we'll be all right. 
one of the reasons people give to an organization is because the organization is going to be there to do the work. Yeah, you this can trust checks them. that box. Um, but it also goes on to say, like, you still have a part to play in it. It's not like we're flush, so you don't have to worry about your giving anymore. Um, and then it gives instructions on, on how to do that. I wonder if a, a section might be added about what is what is continuing, what is ongoing, mm. you know? Yes. Couple of sentences about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Well, that's a neat idea, Sharon. A minute for mission is substituted, sorry, Trish, with a minute for stewardship. I want to keep moving because yep. we're, we're almost an hour in and we haven't got to Trish yet, so. Okay. Um, let's talk a bit about the offering then during worship because in some way, shape or form, pretty much every congregation is still doing something um, around worship, whether it's on Sunday or not, or online or offline or paper or whatever. Um, <clears throat> worship and especially the offering is a great teaching moment about generosity as a spiritual practice. A lot of the stuff we've already talked about today, um, why I give. It's, it's the, a, a great opportunity to inspire, invite and thank um, people um, for what they're doing, how they're making a difference, how they're being disciples of Jesus, um, and, and therefore are part of God's mission in the world. If we take the offering seriously, um, Trish and I were on another webinar earlier this week, and one of the participants there said, the offering should actually be longer now, and because they're doing it online, and so it takes a little longer to explain some things, but it was a key teaching moment. Um, hmm. as part of worship. So that was really neat to see. So I have um, a sample here. This is, um, it comes from Bridgewater United Church <clears throat> in Nova Scotia. It is part of their worship that they did on May the 10th. Um, I'd like us to watch it. And then I have a couple of uh, those, those same questions. What did you notice? And if you did something like this in your setting, what would you do? Um, so there'll be a chance to respond in the chat box. So Stephen, I think if you advance the slide, it should start on its own. There it is. Text doing based. something like that in the uh, in your in your uh, church. Those of you who are doing online services, even recorded ones. That's, yeah. uh, what did you notice? And uh, yeah, how would you do something like that, or would you? Or... Yeah, that's really key to remember to and, and dedicate everything. Dedicate their prayers, dedicate what they're doing, dedicate who they are, as well as what they give. Richard's wondering whether we could get permission to share that little video clip. Um, you want to ask could, the Bridgewater people if they would be willing to allow us to use that? Yeah, that would be the easiest way to do it. They were happy to let me use it for this because I got permission to do that. Mm -hmm touched by the wave from the sidewalk that was that one hit me mm -hmm. i really liked that mm -hmm. i like that it focuses on those simple things that people do that make a human connection with one another you know that wave mm -hmm. and, and it was truly invitational mm -hmm. i don't think it talked about money at all but it sure talked about generosity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have another one here, Dave. I do. Um, so this one is also from Bridgewater. Um, this was the week before on May the 3rd. Um, in this, as part of their worship on May the 3rd, 
and as part of the offering, um, the minister made a direct appeal to people to to um, sign up and be part of PAR, but that's not all that this is about. So yeah, I want us to watch this one uh, as well. And again, similar questions for reflection. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment to talk to you about PAR, pre-authorized remittance. It's a wonderful way for you to express your gratitude and, and to give a gift to our church and to our ministry. Pre-authorized remittance really means just a regular committed contribution that goes from your bank account to our ministry. And it allows us to plan and to budget and to continue the work that we're doing. You know, I know you'll see ads for the United Church of Canada and other ways to sign up for PAR if you Google it or look for it. But please, let me tell you, the easiest way to do this is to simply email us at info at bridgewaterunited.ca. And then we can either set up your account or we can change your contribution amount. Whatever it is that you want to do to support our ministry, um, and we can set it up for you. So I just want to encourage you today to please think about pre-authorized remittance, a regular way to give to our ministry, to support these online worship services, and to be part of our ministry where we create a place where everyone belongs. I also know that many of you support us in a number of ways, through your prayers, through your love, your outreach, your compassion, your phone calls, um, and regular contributions in other ways. And we're truly grateful for that. Today, I just want to encourage you to please consider par. God bless. So again, what did you notice? And if you were going to do something like that in your church, uh, what would you what would you do to adapt that for your place? Thanks for being with us, Morgan. We are recording this. I'll have the recording up by the end of the evening, probably the board meeting tonight. Might, might be tomorrow morning, but we'll we'll get it up shortly so people can watch it. Can you see yourself doing something like this in your congregation? And if so, how would you how would you do that or would you do something different? I liked that it was a clear ask. I liked that it was there was there was I mean there, there's talk about money, but there isn't talk about money, right? Um, mm. There was also very, there were also very good and clear instructions given. Um, so the video has the email address right across the bottom there. This is how you can do it. The congregation's obviously trying to make it easy for people to do this. Dave, is that the minister or is that the finance chair or is that the chair of the board? Who is it? That's the minister. Okay. That's Jeff. And I have no connection to that congregation. It, I, my, one of Trish and I's colleagues, Roger James, who looks after all of Atlantic Canada, has worked with them. And um, so he put me on them. Okay. Jennifer is saying she'd love to do something like this to demystify the e-transfers too. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. You could do different ones every week, right? Yep. Yeah. I think what you're giving us permission to do, Dave, is be explicit about our invitation and to be inspiring in our invitation, but, but to actually do it and to take the opportunity of the offering plate time in worship to, to, to be clear. And maybe we should be doing that when we're back in our sanctuaries too, but yes, absolutely. In this time when everything's up in the air um, to make the offering a little longer, that's a cool idea. Now, one of the things that I had noticed as I looked through the, the samples that I found and, and others is that, that they're not doing that I might encourage you to think about doing is to actually during the offering in whatever format that's taking in your stuff give people the time to go and make the gift then if we're mm. talking about about financial gifts again that's where the donate button on your website comes in um, it's like two extra verses of music in the background or the music to say 
this is a time where you can go to our webpage and click the donate button and make a gift to the church you love to do the ministry that you know needs to happen, however you're going to introduce it, and actually invite them right then and there to go and do it, not assume they might go and do it later or that they've already done it. That's the piece with the offering plate that we have because it goes past us all and we have the chance right then and there to make the gift. Thank you. So we've been talking a lot about gifts to the congregation. And that's, I think, the easiest invitation. Everybody feels a sense of loyalty to their congregation, but we're all in this together. We're part of a much bigger church than just our own congregation. And so I wanted to kind of move from Dave to Tricia and move from congregation to gifts to to some of the other things that we do as church. Tricia, why don't you kind of pull our uh, uh, pull us in that direction now? Yeah, you know, um, I grew up in the United Church, and so mission and service has always been a presence. And I think for me personally, to be honest, it's been so there all the time that I almost missed it or I didn't appreciate it. And I have to tell you that at this time, I've never been so aware and frankly impressed by um, what our gifts together accomplish and are, is accomplishing during this crisis right now. And I've been writing a number of stories about what our mission and service partners are doing during this crisis. They are on the United Church website right now. And maybe one of you could um, could put the link in the chat box while I'm talking about that. That would be helpful. They're in the stories of our faith section of the of the website. But, you know, I've been doing interviews with our partners to be able to write those stories. And I've heard all kinds of amazing things about uh, camps and uh, youth ministers offering children's programming, uh, helping families at this time of isolation and uh, supporting children um, and teens who who need a sense of connection. I've heard from countless organizations who are delivering food and um, helping get medica medications to people. One organization talking about making sure that uh, teen mums-to-be are able to make their uh, appointments, their medical appointments. Um, all kinds of impressive ways that uh, our gifts are on the ground right now working to save and transform lives and inspire meaning and purpose and help build a better world because that's what we do those are the three goals of mission and service right to save and transform lives to inspire meaning and purpose and to build a better world and whether we're doing that in canada or abroad whatever it is that we're doing touches on one of those three three things we have, you know, 72 uh, ministries. We support 72 ministries around the world and 49 here in Canada together. And when you think about that number of organizations, it's not about the organizations, as you know, it's about all those people, those thousands of people who are touched by the work that they do. And so, you know, the the, the impact that we are having right now has never uh, Im impressed me more. Um, and, and people are finding ways to share uh, minutes for mission. Of course, they, they were created for this year in a, in a pre-COVID world when we were all still uh, worshiping together in our buildings. And, and so our stories worked really well. The format of those worked really well in that environment. Some people are finding very creative ways to share them. Uh, the stories we had planned for this this time that are already online, but also the new ones that I'm writing around this situation and what we're doing right now. Um, I've heard from people who are going on the Mission and Service Facebook page and sharing those posts that are there in their online worship. Some that are taking those COVID-related stories, they're about four or 500 words, and reducing them to 100 words and sharing them in that way. Some who are linking to those stories in e-newsletters and, and um, other electronic mediums, 
putting the links in chat boxes during worship. So all kinds of different ways. But I do have one example we wanted to show you today, Stephen, of a congregation. I think it's Trinity United Church in Capriol. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Capriol. Capri Capriol. Okay. And what, it's the next one there. Next one here. Okay. Next, uh, the video. There we go. There we go. Have a look. So it's time to celebrate generosity and give thanks for giving. And I would like to thank all of you for your generosity and your prayers that you're saying for people and the way that you are living out your call to be the church in these unprecedented times. And the question we always ask as followers of Jesus is, what can we do? And so I remember that really old hymn, Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light, you in your small corner and I in mine. We're all in little corners these days. And we can offer our gifts locally. At this season, some folks are helping to make gardens that will feed hungry people. Some of you are using your handiwork to make masks. And you might have heard that our own Arlene Newman has made over 475 and has most recently donated some to the nurse practitioner clinic here. People are phoning to support others who feel out of touch. And many of you are sending in your offerings and continuing your PAR donations. We might also wonder how we can help farther afield, especially when we can't go to the places where the most vulnerable live. But the good news is that the mission and service is ramping up its efforts to help people abroad and in Canada. So one of the, our partners um, are in the Philippines and people who are there tell us how desperate the situation is, people in the southern part of the world. They describe heartbreaking challenges of hunger and poverty and limited access to health care and even just clean water. And so in Manila, um, the mission and service is working with the... Oh, sorry. The uh, organization called ACT, Christian, or sorry, um, I forget what it's called. Uh, Christians Acting Together. Um, and they are providing for 300 of the most needy families in Manila food and hygiene kits there. And the United Church in Canada also is doing some things to help people who are especially affected right now. So in Bray, Gray Bruce, there's a health care chaplaincy. And as you know, people can't be with their loved ones when they're passing away. So they've arranged to have chaplaincy that happens outside with the family members. And there's another place, Coverdale, I'm not sure where that is, but they're working with the, as you know also, people are being let out of jails, but they are released without housing and necessities. So they're helping to reintegrate those people into the community, get them some food, ca food cards and accommodation. And finally, bravo to the people of the United Church and these are people who have left money in their wills to mission and service or to, sorry, to the United Church Foundation so that they can give some grants to United Churches across the country that are struggling to just stay alive during this time. So may we continue our gifts to mission and service being confident that they are doing good work across Canada and the world. And we will, with glad and generous hearts, say our prayer of dedication for all of these offerings. We give thanks to you, God of all bounty, for the gifts with which you sustain and nourish us. In response to your extravagant generosity, we offer you our time, our abilities, our abundance, and our commitment that what you have begun in us may be brought to fruition in your time. Help us to live as people transformed into your faithful disciples. Amen. So, so Stephen, did you want to lead us into some discussion time? Yeah, and we were going to invite people to go into some small groups. Uh, you've seen a variety of different ways of talking about stewardship and and mission and service. We wanted to invite you to go into small groups and to talk 
specifically about the mission of service piece of this because as I said when I was introducing Trish, I think sometimes for our congregations that's more more difficult to, to inspire people. Did this do it for you? Is this the kind of thing you'd like to do? What is inspiring to your congregation about the kinds of things we do as a church instead of just as a congregation? Um, take, let's say, take 10 minutes in small groups to to, to uh, reflect on that and, and think about how might you use stories like this to inspire the people in your congregation? Is that the question you're wanting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it would be helpful if I gave just one story to go into the one story that really impressed me is a, a story from our partners in the Philippines. Absolutely incredible. Um, in, in those some parts of the world, social isolation is being enforced militaristically. And uh, I was here in a meeting hearing from partners how um, people in the Philippines were having to, f or perhaps still are, face having to face the choice of staying inside, staying at home, where some are going hungry, starving, or going outside and risking getting arrested and shot and looking for food and being able to find food. So, I mean, can you imagine having to make that choice between staying at at home and being hungry, or going outside uh, the home and finding food and risking being arrested or shot. And our partners are, some of them are going literally door to door delivering food. And so they're putting their own lives on the line to uh, help people who are in need. It is absolutely incredible. Um, that's just one of the incredible stories that that I've written about and partly I'm I'm writing these stories not just about raising funds for mission and service but it's about raising awareness and also um, lifting up these huge sacrifices that people are making and and really drawing awareness to them and saying thank you thank you for that I think that we all need to be witnessing uh, uh, to one another's <laughs> amazing heroism at this time and uh, certainly we're, we're seeing people who we support through our gifts um, really putting everything on the line to be able to support people around them. So if you were to take that example and to go into those small groups, how would you, how would you share that? What format would you share that in, in, in worship as it is right now? It would be helpful for me to hear from you and hopefully helpful for you to hear from each other as you talk about that. As you, as we take the last few minutes to sort of debrief that, what uh, uh, what jumped out at you in that conversation? What were there new learnings or new ideas or, or new things that you'd like to share with your colleagues? What what was what was the, the key learning from that break? Uh, just put your notes in the chat there. You may have to re restart the chat if it closed on you. Trish is still Keep muted. trying, this, Susan. I love it. Yeah. Yes. Like this is how often do we have to remind people what the gospel is? I guess we have to remind people to be generous just as frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Encourage people to be the body of Christ instead of a club. That's crucial. And I agree. Yep. Stephen. Yeah. Could you please unmute Trish? I'm sorry, Trish. You I can have see the power her mouth moving. There we go. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say thank you to Dave for putting the link into the chat box to the COVID mission and service stories. So you can see Dave Jagger put the link there if you're looking for those. And Brenda's talking about the value of a stewardship committee. Like, this shouldn't Amen. have to be just on the shoulders of the minister. Amen. That's way too much just to do it by yourself. I'm not sure if any kind of change happens in the church if only one person is driving it. I think, I think we need partners in whatever we're doing. Other key learnings, folks? Adding mission and service to our online worship. Is there a, is there a, um, a format in which you would think that was easiest uh, to do that? Is there a, a way of presenting those stories um, so for example, uh, our 30 second videos or uh, short uh, photos with, with 
you know, 200 word stories instead of 500 word stories? Is there a format that would be helpful to you? If you think of um, something now, you can uh, put it into the chat box, but also please contact me because it's one of the things that we're, we're, we're working on, we're trying to do, and we need input from you in order to create the resources that you need. So um, really would be helpful to hear from you around that. Yeah, what's going to work best in the, in the worship you're doing right now? I want to know if we can quote Song Ran Kim. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. that's wonderful. I, that's just beautiful. Remembering how loud important says Jim, how important it is that we're part of something bigger. Yes. We so focused on our own congregation, eh? Mm -hmm. Brenda likes the videos we're already producing. That's helpful, Brenda. Glad mm -hmm. you're using them. Mm -hmm. And Dahl's not able to do video, so likes the idea of something short that can be read. So it's mm -hmm. a bit of everything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's who we are as a church. That's that's cool. Mm -hmm. We were wondering about mix and match, you know, so photo, short, uh, short blurb, longer story, short video, longer video, you know, that depending on the context, because we don't know going forward what context we'll find ourselves in. So wondering if that might be helpful. Yeah, there's Rolando doing something written in her bulletin every week. Yeah. I think they just want you to do everything, Trish. Yes. <laughs> well, there, Brenda just said it. If you can do a variety of things, that'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's yeah. that that's also part of the new reality sure. of church today, isn't it? It's yeah. it's complex. Yeah. You know, you told us that that Bridgewater, those two videos from Bridgewater were used yeah. in two back-to-back -back worship services. Right. Two very different ways of making an invitation. Yes. A week apart. So yeah, yes. that makes sense. The variety. Maybe maybe when we only do the minute for mission, it gets stale. <laughs> maybe when we only do the offering plate, we forget what it was for. Yeah. We did a, on, on Giving Tuesday, we did a series on social media, uh, we called the Bravo series, and it was a photo with Bravo, and it was basically saying Bravo to those mission and service partners who are doing something awesome right now it, to respond to needs in this crisis, and it was a short little blurb and, and a photo that said Bravo, and I know that people were using those, so that mm -hmm. might be another thing that if you're interested to have a look at. And I would like to remind us of, it was in the chat box earlier on up. Um, I don't remember, sorry, I don't remember who, who did it. Um, but the comment was made to remember that the people who are here with us, it was Jennifer said, it is good to assume the people want to give and are looking to find out how, not that you're convincing them and then they need to give. Mm -hmm. So how can we, in all of these things, place before our folks ways to give that they can see how they're living out their ministry through these opportunities whether they're mission and service or whether they're mm -hmm. in their backyard or whether wherever they are however they're done um uh, we're not trying to wring money out of people that's not what mm -hmm. this is about mm -hmm. this is about mm -hmm. spiritual practice and generosity and helping people to do what they are inclined and built by god to do mm -hmm. to be generous mm -hmm. i think that's the point to close Mm -hmm. I, I think that is where we're at, and that's that's a, a wonderful summary of everything we've talked about in the last 90 minutes. It's about three minutes past the top of the hour, and so I apologize for running three minutes long, but I'm grateful for the, for the participation that people have had and the comments people have put into the chat. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and for hanging in there with us and for the ways that you inspire your congregation to, to live out their mission, that's, uh, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Next week, we're going to do something similar around outreach. We've invited people from Edge Ministries to come and talk to us about community partners and some of the inspiring things that, that congregations are doing to live out their mission in ways that are brand new because of the pandemic. So come back and join us then. Week after that, a Plans are still not solid, but we're looking at uh, how do we move back into our church buildings? How do we move back into our sanctuaries? Do we need to reimagine worship if we're not going to be allowed to sing hymns together? Some of those kinds of issues are, are certainly on the drawing board. Um, and 
not sure exactly who's going to be our our uh, uh, even our facilitator yet on that one, but that's where we're going. So thank you, thank you for uh, all of the work you're doing, and may God bless you as you go into uh, into the other aspects of your ministry. We'll look forward to seeing you again. Bye for now. Thank you.